Heavenly Father, we come before your throne in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Lord, for having brought us into your presence. Father, you are the creator God. We pray that you will create things, Lord, those things that are without form and those things that are white. As you moved, as your spirit moved on that day in the book of Genesis chapter 1, we pray that you, your spirit will hover over us. Let your word Bring forth the change, Lord, transformation within us. You are the refiner. We pray that you will remove all the drawers, unwanted things from our lives. You are our heavenly potter. We pray that you will remove all the stony parts from us and you will change us, Lord. Fashion us according to your perfect will. You are our heavenly gardener. We pray that you will prune us, Lord, remove all those unwanted things. Those evil things, the unholy things that we will bear more fruit to you, God. Father, we seek your working this morning. Father, it is you that we need, Lord. We pray that you will look on us, that your look will be upon us. Your all-searching eyes shall be upon us. Not only searching us, Lord, but also we will yield our lives, commit our lives to your working, Lord. Father, we humble ourselves in your presence. Father, I pray that you will put the appropriate words in my mouth, Father. That you will feed your people, Lord. That you will feed us with your word. With your word. That, Lord, man shall not live by bre just bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth, Lord. When your truth comes, it sanctifies us. When we are sanctified, we become a glorious church in your sight. Ready to be prepared to meet the Lord. Thank you, God. Even now, Father, we come against every hindrance in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every distractions. We come against every demonic power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we claim victory in your name. Let your name alone be glorified and magnified. In Jesus' precious name we pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. The title for the morning message is The Look of the Lord. The Look of the Lord. Would you turn your Bibles to Psalm 33, verses 13 to 15? Psalm 33, verses 13 to 15. This is a wonderful passage of scripture where we find the Lord looks from heaven and nothing is hidden from the sight of the Lord. I believe you have taken this passage. Let me read it. And if you have taken it, read it along with me. Here we go. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considered all their works. That, as the title goes, the look of the Lord. Look at what the Lord says in these three verses, 13 to 15. The Lord looketh from the heaven. He beholdeth. From the place of his habitation, he looks upon the inhabitants. 15, he considers all their works. And nothing can escape from the all-seeing eye of the Lord. Though the Lord is in heaven, Bible says he looks from heaven. And nothing is hidden from the sight of the Lord. We all know what happened in Boston Marathon bomb blast. They could not track down the perpetrators. They could not. Narrow down the terrorists until an Israeli technology technologist found out found out the culprits through a CCTV footages. The Israeli technology it found out the culprits and they narrowed down the culprits. They arrested. Even Israeli technology could find out the culprits just with just CCTV footages. From the crowd, from the street, streets, we all know this, those incidents, how the culprits were narrowed down. Even Israeli technology has so much of power to look into the actions, the, sus the suspicious actions of the terrorists, how much more the God of Israel, how much more the Lord God of Israel can look in. Look at this verse, the Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men from the place of his habitation. He looks Upon all the inhabitants of the earth, he considers all their works. Dear child of God, we are going to take part in the Holy Communion. All that we need today is God's all-seeing eye to scan our hearts, to scan all our works, to scan all our motives that we will 
amend our ways that we will change our actions that we will correct our lives that we will take part in the holy in the, in the holy sacraments worthily this is what god expects from us that we will yield to his look his scanning look let us not resist what god is showing to us let us not say lord it is not me if why say i don't have sin in my heart i deceive myself the bible says i need to tell the lord lord there are so many areas of imperfections within me there are so many areas that i need to correct myself that i i want you to show to me lord that are those areas that i do not know look at this verse the, those three verses you can find one thing one word common one word common in all the three verses just three lettered word can you find out that three lettered word that is common in all the three verses that we read all all the lord looked from heaven he beheld all the sons of men from the place of his habitation he looked upon all the inhabitants of the earth he fashioned their hearts alike he considered all their works when the lord looks he looks at all when i say all all means all when i say all 100% not even one iota escapes the sight of the lord the lord views everything the lord sees everything man can bribe people bribe authorities and hide certain things but when he stands before the lord all nothing can nothing can stop him from from being him being exposed to the lord he is 100% exposed before the lord look at this verse all sons of men from heaven the lord looks all sons of men all the inhabitants inhabitants of the earth and all the works nothing is hidden before the lord think about moses the lord looked at moses moses hid his face he thought by hiding his face from the look of god he can avoid the look of god but he couldn't hallelujah dear child of god the, the all seeing eyes of the lord the look of the lord is upon you the lord looks upon us to bless us but this morning the lord looks at us to scan us to tell us the areas that we have gone wrong to show us the areas that we need to amend our lives and take part in the holy communion worthily and to stand before him hallelujah worthily i believe this morning the lord is so very gracious enough to grant us his look to scan our lives hallelujah those areas that we do not know those areas those those you know imperfections that we have never seen those shortcomings that we have never perceived in our minds may the lord scan our lives one day the lord will look at all the people when he sits on the white throne and before that look could happen the lord looks at us now before the look of judgment upon us the lord looks at us to correct our lives bible says righteous man is compensated on the earth itself he doesn't need to stand before the white throne judgment the lord scans the righteous man and the righteous man he yields himself to the working of the lord how many of us can tell the lord lord here i am in your presence as you scan me lord as you look at my life i will yield it i will heal 100% i will say yes to all that you say all that you point out at me aken hid everything under his tent he thought nobody saw but the all seeing eye of the lord the lord said a cursed thing is in the camp of israel the lord found out the lord found out the accursed thing people you people may hide things from the lord why people may hide things from others they can hide from joshua they can hide before all the people of god but they cannot hide from the eyes of god ananias sapphira they could tell a lie to peter but they could not hide before the eyes of the holy ghost they said peter said how can you lie to the holy ghost how can you hide before the holy ghost the holy ghost sees every action the look of the lord the lord look at from heaven the child of god if, if the lord is showing you areas of your imperfections if the lord looks at those areas surrender your life in the presence of god and you shall be blessed the longer we 
hide things. The longer we keep those things within ourselves, the longer our struggle, the longer it becomes our turmoil. And this morning God says, I'm looking at your lives. No one sees you, but I'm looking, I'm watching. Look at those three words that the Spirit of God shows in this three verses. The three, three, wor three words, three different words. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. He looketh upon all the inhabitants. He considereth all their works. Three words. He looks, he beholds, he considers. Three different words. All denoting the synonymous with the word look. He looks, he beholds, and he considers. Three different words. And three different words give a diff three different as aspect, three dis different perspective of his looking. How many of you are with me? How many words that we just saw? Three different verses. Number one, look. Number two, behold. Number three, consider. Three different aspects of his look. Number one, behold. The Hebrew word used for behold is nabath, which means to look with expectation. How does the Lord look at us? He looks at us with an expectation. With an expectation. Even now, this morning, as we are seated in the presence of God, God looks at each one of us with an expectation. Just as how the Lord expected a good fruit, a good, fig, good wine from the vineyard that he planted. He expected, he looked with an expectation. The Lord looked at the fig tree with an expectation that it will give, that it will give fruit. But he did not give. The, wind, the wine that the Lord planted, he looked at it with an expectation that it will give good wine. But it gave bitter wine. This morning the Lord says, I'm expecting you with, I'm looking at you with an expectation. Who else deserves who else can look at us with an expectation other than our Lord? He has saved us. He has protected us. He has put a hedge around us. He had put manure to, for our roots to, so, so that we will bear fruits. Who else ex can expect this kind of look, can expect this kind of expectation except the Lord? He expects, he looks at us with an expectation. As you are seated in the presence of the Lord, dear child of God, People may expect from many things from you. You may try to do certain things according to the expectations of your boss in your office. Expectations of your friends. Expectation of your spouse. Expectations of your children. But this morning, what about the expectations from the Lord? He looks at you with an expectation that you will bear fruit that will please his heart. This morning, the Lord beholds. The Lord looks at the sons of men with an expectation the Lord, what was the worst, you know, what did the, why did the Lord expect this kind of, why did the Lord look at them, you know, with this expectation? The verse previous to this verse, Bible says, that is Psalm 33, 33 verse 12. What does the Bible say? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The nation whose God is the Lord. The Lord ex looks with the expectation because, you know, he expects from his people. We are his people. And we need to fulfill the expectation of God. We need to fulfill the expectation of God. Number two, the Lord looks. The Lord looks. The Bible, the, the, the meaning is Raha. Raha means to gaze, to consider, to scan. Bible says, let, let's look at that verse. The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. You know, all the sons of men. He, from the place of his habitation, he looks upon all the inhabitants. The Lord scans. The Lord scans just as our antivirus in our computer scans. The Lord scans. The Lord searches everything this morning. As you are seated in the presence of God, offer a prayer to God. Sincere prayer to God. Lord, more than you laying your hands upon me and blessing me. I know, Lord, I am in need. I know I'm going through struggle. I know I have problems. But this morning, Lord, I pray that your scanning eyes will scan my life. And spot out and find out 
every virus that is trying to corrupt my system, corrupt my mind. Scan within me, Lord. Scan in me, Lord. Let your scanning eyes scan me. How many of us can tell the Lord? With a, with a heart longing for holiness, with a desire to get sanctified in His presence, with an earnestness to take part in the Lord's table worthily, would you lift up your voice and hands in the presence of God? Let the Lord see our hands. Let not man see us. There's no point in pleasing people. The greatest thing in all our lives is to please the Lord. Lord, scan my life. Find out those viruses, Lord. I don't, I'm not able to see those things, but you can see, Lord. For you are the purer of eyes than to behold evil. You cannot look on iniquity. You cannot look on iniquity. Lord, if there is iniquity in my heart, you cannot look at my life. I pray that you will remove, that you, do, that you will show those areas. I'm willing to uproot every thought of iniquity, every thought of sin from my mind, from my life. That I will be a worthy vessel before your sight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Look at the third word mentioned in this verse. In the three verses. He considereth all their works. The word consider. It, is, it gives an interesting meaning. Do you know how the Lord looks? What is the third perspective of God's look in these three verses? The third one considers is the Lord dissects everything. The Lord dissects each part one by one, one by one, one by one. And he throws his scanning look at it. When I say the Lord gazes, the Lord scans, you know, this third word consider, the meaning, the AHLB Bible gives this meaning, you know, the AHLB dictionary gives the meaning. The Lord dissects every area, every part, bit by bit, you know, inch by inch, ounce by ounce, iota by iota, and he scans. The Lord scans. If the Lord comes and scans, will you be comfortable now? Will you feel, Lord, it's okay, Lord, you can come. Will you allow the Lord? I was reminded of one of the stories that I was taught in my youth. It seems the Lord, you know, came in a dream of a young man. He was an aspiring young boy. He wanted to come up in his life. And the Lord told him, I want to see every area in your house. Can I? And this guy showed every area, the kitchen, the living room, his, you know, the table tennis room. He showed everything. The Lord came and stood at the small room which was locked, which wasn't opened. And the Lord looked at this young boy and said, can I, can I get into this room? And this boy was shocked. And he said, Lord, you cannot go inside that room. You won't be happy there. And the Lord said, I want to get into this room. I want to see what is there. Lord, I know there are filthy in, in this room. It was I who kept everything in, inside this room. I don't want you to come into this room and look at it. And the Lord said, I want to come in and see. And he, the Lord, and, and, and he said, Lord, if you just come inside, you will get, you will get, you will not be happy, Lord. You will become dirty. Everything inside is dirty. I don't want you to step in there. Every time I step into that room, I get dirty. And I come out and I kneel before you. And you also wash me and cleanse me. I become a new person. And the Lord said, I want to make this room clean. Just as I clean you every day with my precious blood. And the Lord stepped into that room and washed him. And the Lord laid his hand upon him and blessed that young boy in the dream. And he became a blessed child, dear child of God. What is that one room that you are still closing to the Lord? Still say, Lord, I don't want you to get into this room. You can, you can inspect every other area of my life. But I will never, I cannot, Lord. Because it is filthy. It is really filthy. That I cannot even disclose it to my parents. Cannot even disclose it to my friends. This morning the Lord who dissects every area of your life. And inspects it. He comes 
right now into this sanctuary and he looks at you face to face and he says, I want to inspect this area, this one part of your life. Would you surrender your life? This morning God's look is upon you. Dear child of God, nothing else can save us. Nothing else can save us. The Lord's eye. Are you willing to surrender your life? As the Lord as the Lord dissects every area and inspects and finds out all those corrupt things. If you can surrender your life to God, you'll be become a worthy vessel. Just as how the Lord laid his hand upon that young boy, blessed him. You shall be blessed by the Lord. Your life shall never be a struggle. Your life will never face storms anymore. Even if you face storms, the Lord will lead you through and you will reach the shore successfully. The Lord's hand of blessing will be upon you. How many of you believe the Lord is speaking to you? Never resist the voice of the Spirit of God. Never resist the voice of the Spirit of God. If the Lord shows you some area in your life that you need to uproot certain things, remove it in Jesus' name today itself before you take part in the Holy Spirit sacraments tell the lord lord here i am open before your dissecting view dissecting sight that removes every unwanted things in my life i am in your presence lord open to your working may the lord bless us amen nothing can save us nothing can help us only the look of god can save us look at the next few verses 16 verse 16 and 17 there is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. And neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. But the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. Upon them that hope in his mercy. To deliver their soul from death. To keep them alive in famine. Do you know what the blood is? The blessedness of God scanning our lives. The blessedness is God protecting us. Look at the verses the Spirit of God writes, that David writes through the urge of the Spirit, verse 16. There's a king who has a multitude of hosts, but he is not saved by the multitude of hosts. He has much strength. There's a mighty man who has might, you know, much strength within himself, but he is not saved. There is a horse which is kept for safety, even that us cannot provide the safety. Neither shall he deliver by his great strength. All that we need is God's eyes. God looks at everyone who fears him. The Lord looks at everyone who hopes in his mercy. Would you tell the Lord, Lord, I will fear before you. I will live a life of fear of God. I will fear before you, Lord. What does David say in Psalm 5? Lord, I will come before you in the multitude of your mercy. And with your fear, I will worship you. With your fear, I will worship you. I will hope in your mercy, Lord. If I hope in your mercy, I will not fall down. I will not sin for your grace. Grants me the ability, strength to resist every sin, every thought of wickedness. Hallelujah, dear child of God. Before the, as I said, before the Lord looks at us at the day of judgment, we need to yield our lives to the scanning eyes, to the scanning look of God and amend our ways. Nothing is hid before the Lord. Nothing is hid before the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13, we all know this verse. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are open. All things are opened. And open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. With, him, we, with whom we have to do. Would you look at this verse please. Look at the last phrase of this verse. The last part. The last segment of this verse. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The paraphrased Bible explains the last three words, last four words, we have to do. What have we to do? The last, the paraphrase Bible says that we have to settle accounts with God. That we have to settle accounts. If you have any other translation, you can find this meaning that we have to do. We have to do is to settle accounts that we have to stand before Him 
and give accounts. We are accountable only to God. And Bible says, all creature, there is, there is, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are exposed. All things are exposed. Before that day could happen, let the word of the Lord sanctify us. Let us yield our lives. Let us, when the Lord scans us, let us not say, Lord, it is not me. Lord, it is not I. Let us say, Lord, here I am. I say yes to all that you say. All that you say. Thank you, Lord. Dear child of God, if the Lord is speaking to you, never resist to the voice of the Holy Spirit. David, when he wrote Psalm 139, he says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understand my thought afar off. Thou compass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind me before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. David was running away from the sight of the Lord. He thought by hiding in a cave, he can, you know, you can cover himself. You know, look at what he says. Look at verse 7. Let us all read verse 7. Psalm 119, verse 7. Shall we all read together as loud as possible? Whither shall I go from thy spirit? And whither shall I flee from thy presence? It says, if I ascend up to heaven, you are there, Lord. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand lead me, thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Dear child of God. What we do in night. Is broad daylight before his sight. What we do in night times. The Lord scans it. The Lord watches over it. We may hide. You may hide things from your family members. Young children, you can hide from your father, mother. The Lord scans it. The Lord knows what you are watching. In the pitch of the dark, what you do with your mobile phone, what you contemplate on your mind, what you think about in your mind, the Lord sees it just as how it is done in a broad daylight. And if the Lord is speaking to you, it simply means the Lord is coming after you. You are running away from the Lord. David says, where shall I go from your spirit, Lord? Whither shall I flee from your presence? What does he say? What is he really saying? Lord, every time I go away from you, you are at the back of me. You are just weaving your, you are throwing your all scanning eyes upon me. You are throwing your... Your look that scans every motive. The Lord really loves you. That's the reason why the Lord scans you. Will you correct anyone's, anyone else's child if they make a mistake? When we walk on the road, we see so many people doing all sorts of unwanted things, smoking, you know, you know in getting involved in unwanted things. We're not bothered about it. But if you see your son or daughter, if I see my son or daughter, I won't be passive. I step into the action. I say, I try to control my child. Why is the Lord coming at the back of you? Because the Lord has chosen you. Before the foundation of the earth, the Lord loves you. The Lord has a plan for you. The Lord has a plan for you, dear child of God. If you feel like the Lord is coming behind you always, trying to correct your life, it does not mean the Lord is against you. 
the Lord loves you. Whom the Lord loves, he chastises. There is no son who is not chastised by the father. Behind every chastisement, there's love. He wants to make you holy. He wants to make you holy. Hallelujah. He says, my substance was not hid from thee, Lord. When I was made in secret, curiously wrought in the lowest part of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. If, the, if you're still alive, it is because the Lord loves you. You could have died a long time ago. You, probably in, when you were in your mother's womb, some of you, the Lord protected you. You were born into this world miraculously. Many people predicted, medical science predicted that you, would be, you wouldn't be alive, you wouldn't be born. But you are still here. It's because God's predestination upon you. The Lord loves you. The Lord has a plan for you. And finally, David gave in to the Lord and he said, verse 23, Let us offer this as our prayer. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Shall we all offer this prayer from our heart? Let the Lord hear us. Let not somebody who sits next to you hear this. Let the Lord hear you. Search me, O oh God. 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 And know my heart. Know my heart. Know my heart, Lord, try me and know my thoughts. Oh, know my thoughts and see if there be. There are so many things that I don't see, Lord, I'm not able to see. Right now, Lord, I pray that you will see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me in the everlasting. How many of us can tell the Lord? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked ways in me cleanse me from every sin and set me free with one voice search me oh God and know my heart today try me oh savior and know my thoughts i pray i pray lord see if there be there are lord there are so many areas we can raise in me lord Cleanse me, Lord. Cleanse me. Oh, feel the presence of God. Set me free. Set me free, Lord. Set me free. Let your look set me free. Thank you, Lord. I just want to share briefly four thoughts. How, what happens when God looks at us? And how should we respond to God's look? All these four thoughts are related to the life of Peter. Let us examine our lives, the light of these four thoughts. Four thoughts, number one. What does the Lord, Lord's look do to us? Number one, reconstruction. Number two, rebuke. Number three, recompense. Number four, reminder. Number one, what is number one? Reconstruction. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 42. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 42. We all know this incident in the scripture, in the Bible, in the Gospels. But let us look at this verse. There's something that we need to learn from this 
one verse. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 42. This is the first encounter that Peter had with the Lord. As many of us know, the first encounter that Peter had with the Lord wasn't when the Lord stepped into his boat. The Lord asked him to reach out to the deep and Peter enclosed n number of fishes. It wasn't the first incident. It was uh, one of the incidents that happened after this incident. This is the first ever incident that Peter had with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you understand the Gospels in a chronological order, this is the first time that Peter had an encounter with the Lord. Let us read John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 42. And he brought him to Jesus. When Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Shall we all read this verse together? And he brought him to Jesus. When Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. As we all know, this is the first encounter that Peter had with the Lord. And Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 18, that mentions, that records that Peter, in closing n number of fishes along with John and his friends, that wasn't the first encounter. This is the first encounter. Peter was brought before Jesus Christ. Probably you may be a person seated by having a testimony, I did not come. I was brought. Somebody brought me to this church. Somebody brought me to Jesus Christ. God always uses somebody to bring us. And if you are that person, the Lord is looking at you. The Lord, as just as of God beheld Peter, the Lord beholds you. The Lord looks at you. Probably you may say, I did not choose the Lord. I was taken to the Lord. My friend brought me, my relative brought me, my neighbor, my colleague, he brought me to the Lord. Hallelujah. What happened with Simon it can happen with us also. Bible says, Jesus beheld him. This look from the Lord really reconstructed Peter. This one look reconstructed the life of Peter. Do you know, you know, many, many, ma many of us understand, many of us think like when the Lord stepped into the boat of Peter, you know, Peter gave it voluntarily without even knowing who Jesus was. It wasn't so. It didn't happen like that. Peter knew who Jesus was when the Lord stepped into his boat in Matthew's gospel chapter 4. But this incident is the first time the Lord looked at Peter. His view, his look, his beholding was something special in the life of Peter. It, was, it, it, it really changed his life. It really changed his life. Jesus beheld Peter like no other human being beheld Peter. He said, as it was like, you know, the Lord beheld him and marked him as his bride, as his disciple, as his follower. The Lord marked his look, marked him as, the, as his bride, dear child of God. The same God looks at each one of us and he has marked us as his bride. I want to emphasize, looking at each one's face, eye to eye, and I say, you are the bride of Christ. Never lose sight of your calling. Your calling is not just a Christian. Your calling is not a convert. Your calling is to become, is to be the bride of Christ. Your calling is the disciple. You are a disciple of the Lord. We shouldn't stop with just conversion experience. We should get into a deeper relationship with God saying, Lord, I am your bride. Look at all the bride of Christ, of God in the Bible. They all had a face-to-face -face relationship with God. Can you see Jesus beholding Peter? The Lord looking at Peter and the, Peter looks at the face of God face to face. Can you imagine this? This is what God expects from us. To have face to face relationship. The first lie, you know, the Lord looked at Peter face to face. Abraham, he stood before the Lord. Abraham stood before the Lord. Elijah, he had a face to face encounter with the Lord. David says, I have kept the Lord always before me. 
Moses, he saw the face of God. And the, all the 70 elders, Bible records, all the 70 elders, they, they saw the face of God. The child of God, each one of us. In the Lord beholds. Do you know how the Lord reconstructs our lives only by having a face-to-face -face relationship with us? The face-to-face -face relationship with God reconstructed the life of Peter. And the same relationship can reconstruct us. What did the Lord say? Look, what, 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 was, what, did, what happened there? What really happened there? When, the, when, when he had when he had face-to-face -face relationship, when he had, you know, face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, he heard the Lord speak. Do you know to whom God really speaks? We all come and sit in the, in the sanctuary, listen to the word of the Lord. Some are not active. Some don't even pay, you know, attention to the scripture verses. Some don't, you know, they, they hear the preaching as Greek and Latin to them. What is the reason? Why is that the, the word that comes from the pulpit doesn't get into your system? It's because there's no face-to-face -face relationship. If you have, if I have a face-to-face -face relationship with God, I need to. I will surely hear. I will hear my bridegroom speak to me. I will hear the Lord speak to me. Hallelujah. Decide to have a desire to have the face-to-face -face relationship. You know, Andrew brought Peter to Jesus and Jesus was before Peter. You know, Andrew, you know, people like if you are a senior believer, if you are a servant of God, if you are leading somebody to Christ, make sure to make them stand before the Lord. Every Andrew, every senior believer, uh, every servant of God, his one desire is that Peter stands before the face of God. What did Paul cry out? How does Paul cry out? That I have espoused you to one husband, Christ Jesus, that I may present you to him. That they will stand before, that you will stand before the bridegroom. So every heart's cry, you know, the heart, heart's cry of, you know, the servants of God is to make the church stand before the Lord. This morning, stand before the Lord. Hallelujah. Stand before the Lord. Bible says the Lord beheld, Jesus beheld Peter. He beheld him. You know, the, the Greek meaning of the word beheld is to, you know, to discern something beyond human view. To discern something beyond human eyesight. Something beyond the natural. Something beyond the natural. What did the Lord really see? What did the Lord really see in Peter? Look at what the Lord says. Look at the Lord, what's, what the Lord says. You are Simon. Let's read that verse. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 42. Have you taken this verse? Let me turn my pages. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon. This look reconstructed you know, Simon. Look of reconstruction. Thou art Simon. I see the Lord seeing the present state of Simon. Nobody introduced his name to Jesus. The, Lord, the Messiah... Christ, the anointed one, the bridegroom, looks at Peter and says, you are Simon, the child of God. No one knows your present condition just as how much the Lord knows. Man will look at your outside appearance. He knows everything, but the Lord knows everything about you. He looks at you just the way you are. Sometimes you put a mask before others. There's agony inside be behind that mask. There's reproach. There's tears. There's anxiety. No one sees it, but the Lord sees you. You are Simon. The Lord knows your presence. The Lord says, You son of Jonah, thou son of Jonah. The Lord knew the past of Peter. The Lord knew his past. How does the look of God reconstruct it? The Lord revealed the present state of Peter. The Lord also told him, 
you are the son of Jonah. The Lord know, knew his past. The Lord knows your past. The Lord knows your background. The Lord knows your father's name, your family. He knows everything about you. Maybe sit in the presence of God as nobody. Brother, nobody knows me. Nobody really understands what I go through in my mind. But the Lord knows everything that you are going through. The look of God scans your past. O oh, son of Jonah. Probably you may say, there's nobody for me. Who said there's nobody for you? You have your bridegroom scanning you, telling you, I know your past. I know your background. Nobody needs to introduce you to me. Because you are engraved in the palm of his hands. You are really special in the sight of the Lord. Who really this Peter was? He was the fisherman. The Lord did not call him. Thou fisherman, the Lord said. The, call, the Lord called him by his name. Dear child of God, people will really discriminate you if they only come to know your background. If they only know, come to know what is your salary, you can expect your own treatment from them. But God is not like that. He was, he was like, you know, he was an ordinary fisherman. But the Lord saw something. The Lord said, thou art Simon, thou son of Jonah. The Lord doesn't see, the Lord doesn't respect us according to our background. He values us according to the love that he has for each one of us. His love is so deep that he shed his precious blood on the cross. His love is so immense that he has chosen us. To be his bride. Let us tell the Lord. Lord I know you know my presence. What did the Lord say? Thou shall be called Cephas. Which is by interpretation a stone. The Lord. Predicted his future. What did the, how did the Lord. Reconstruct the life of Peter. The Lord looked at him. And told him. I know your past. I know your present. And I am telling you the future. Your future is not just fishermen, but fishers of men. You're not going to be an ordinary man. You're going to become a great apostle. Hallelujah. How many of you believe the Lord has got tremendous plans for each one of us? Bless somebody sitting next to you. Bless somebody. The Lord has a future for you. Beyond your wildest imagination. You think really insignificant. The stones which the builders rejected shall become the capstone. It is the Lord who does this thing. It is the doing of the Lord. And it shall be marvelous to those builders who rejected you. The Lord says, Thou shall be called Cephas. The name Simon, this name Simon, one of the meanings is, there are so many meanings, one of the meanings is read. Read. Which can be become, it can become bruised. Reed doesn't stay straight when the strong winds blow against it. When somebody pushes, probably you may be like that person. Probably you look really strong and strong, but inside of you, you are not as strong as you are outside. You may be, say, you may be saying, Lord, I'm really weak and feeble in my mind. People look at me like a gigantic figure, but they do not know how feeble, how bruised within myself. The Lord looks at you and he says, I no more call you Simon, I call you Cephas. Cephas means a strong, a boulder, a strong person. The Lord is granting you a structure. The Lord is constructing you through his look. And he looks at you and says, you shall be called Cephas. You shall become a boulder. Dear child of God, the Lord looked at timid Gideon. The Lord said, Thou mighty man of valor. If you look at the life of Gideon, he was such a timid, fearful. He, he, was, he, always, he was always afraid. He could not thresh the wheat openly. He threshed you know, the wheat by hiding it. He could not destroy the grove. He could not destroy the idol Baal openly. During the broad day, broad day light, he destroyed it. In the night time, he was afraid. He was really afraid. He was afraid to go into the camp of the Midianites. And the Lord said, if you are really afraid, take Pura with you. And he took Pura with him because he was afraid. But the Lord looked at him and he said, I see something beyond your fear. You are a mighty man of valor. And you may be in the presence of God as nobody. The Lord looks at you and he says, Hallelujah, thou mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. 
Would you believe what the Lord says? Don't believe what people say. People call you, may, may call you Simon, you know, you know, somebody who is feeble, weak. But the Lord changes you to Cephas. I was really amazed to look at the verses, few verses that really touched my heart. You know, the Lord says, look at how the Lord identifies it's Matthew's Gospel 16, 18. Would you turn your Bibles and look at these two words. Two words. Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. Upon this I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Look at, you know, the Lord saying. Thou art called Peter. Upon this rock, the Lord points out to himself as a rock. Cephas, Cephas, you know, Peter in Greek is Petros. Petros means a rock. The Lord made him a rock. The Lord made Peter a rock and he identifies himself as a rock, a stone. Can you find out, can you understand, God puts a similarity between Peter and himself. By making Cephas a stone, the Lord refers himself to a stone. By making both of them, you know, by making, C, you know, Simon Cephas a stone, he identified himself with Simon. Okay, this is, how many of you understand this? Could I hear a amen from you? At least let the person sitting next to you hear, hear you say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. The bridegroom identifies himself with the bride. He makes a common nature. Similarity. You know the content of Cephas is the same as the content of the Lord Jesus. A stone. Upon this stone I will build a church. I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall. What about us? Apostle Peter same Peter, who was turned from Simon to Cephas, writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. Look at these verses, please. Really a wonderful, awesome verse. We can find out the similarity between our Lord Jesus Christ and us. Who are we and who He is? There's a similarity between our, but between our Lord and us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, verse, verses 4 to 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. And to whom... Coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, you also as lively stones are built upon a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. The Lord is called the living stone and we are called lively stones. Can you find stone? Stone in the Lord and stone with us? Similarities. We are the bride of Christ. Dear child of God, the Lord is reconstructing your life. Change your perspective. You are a bride of Christ. The Lord is identifying. Look at the, all those people in the, in the life of all those people whom the Lord changed their names. From Abraham to Abraham. We all know this truth. Abraham, the Lord added one letter, Hebrew letter, He, from his own initial. The Lord gave his initial to Abraham. Sarai to Sarah. Sarah, that, you know, hey, letter A hey, from, his, from his name, from his divine name, he gave his own initial. When the Lord gives, when somebody gives his initial, it means, you know, the Lord says, you know, it, it means, you know, it's a relationship between, you know, husband and wife, bride and bridegroom relationship. Think about the Lord changed Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel. What is the last two letters that you find in the name Israel? El, God. Son, the Lord changed his surname. You know, God made Jacob his bride. If the Lord is changing, if the Lord has changed you, the Lord has changed your nature. When I say, how do you know the Lord has changed my name? How can I be sure that the Lord has changed my name? I didn't hear from God, from heaven or from any prophet my name is changed dear brother dear sister the hebraic understanding of name is nature 
Hebraic understanding of name is nature. First, you know, first Samuel chapter 25, verse 25. As his name, so he is. Your changed nature, your changed nature. If the Lord is asking you to change your nature, that truth itself says that you have a different name. And your different name has got the bridegroom's surname in it. How many of you believe? You and I are the bride of Christ. The Lord reconstructed. The Lord's look. The Lord looked at Peter and he said, Thou shalt no more be called Simon. You shall be called Cephas. Which is by interpretation a stone. Dear child of God. The only thing that the Lord, that we need to do is, Lord, look at me. Look at me. Now, I want to ask you one thing from this passage, John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 40, 42. What motivated, what drove Peter to go to Jesus? It, you know, Andrew brought Jesus to Peter. But something happened. Something happened. Before that, that really arrested Peter's attention. Let me go and see. Can somebody tell me what happened? Can somebody read as quickly as possible and tell me? We all know this incident. Can somebody tell me? What drove? Probably two, three verses before, verse 42. Brother? Heard him speak. Heard him speak. Who heard him speak? Disciples. Uh, somebody told Peter about someone. Andrew. What did Andrew tell to Peter? We have found the Messiah. This arrested These people have seen the Messiah. I too need to see. I need to know Messiah. This should be our longing. What should be our response to God's look of reconstruction? What should be our response to know our Messiah? How did they know that Jesus was the Messiah? If you look at the incident very carefully, John the Baptist points out his finger as Jesus was passing that side. John the Baptist points out his finger, finger and tells him, Behold, Jesus was introduced to these two people as the Lamb of God. But how did they understand the Lamb of God as the Messiah? Thou sitting on him. When you read it out, you can find it out. They abode with Jesus. They abode out. Can you find out? Can you read that verse? Can you find out that verse? John's Gospel chapter 37 to 39. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where thou dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. They abode with him, abiding with him. Revealed, opened their eyes to look at Jesus, not as the Lamb of God, but as the Messiah. John the Baptist did not tell them, this is Messiah. He told them, behold the Lamb of God, abiding with Jesus. What should be our response to God's look of reconstruction? Lord, I will abide with you. I will abide with you. Do you know what is the Greek definition of the word abiding means? To remain in a place. To remain, to tarry and not to depart from that place. And be there for a time, for a time until, until you become, until you achieve, until you, you know, find out the purpose, until you find out the success. Abiding means. One of the meanings is, don't become another person. You don't become another person. When you are abiding in the presence, the thought is this. The Lord, the, our response to the look, God's look of reconstruction is to abide. How many of us can tell the Lord, Lord, I will stay with you. I will abide with you. Jesus said, abide in me. And my word in you. 
and you will be my disciples. I will reconstruct your life. You will bear much fruit. You will bear more fruits. Reconstruction. How many of us can respond to God's look of reconstruction? How many of us? Lord, I will abide with you. I will spend time with you. I will spend time with you. How many times the mobile phones steal our time? TV shows, you know, sports, uh, World Cup, football, steals our time. Let us tell the Lord, Lord, I will spend time with you. The Bible says it was about the 10th hour. Isn't it so? The Bible says it was about the 10th hour, but verse 39. What is 10th hour? When did they really seek? Somebody said, I heard somebody say, 10th hour means what? 4 p.m. Impeccable answer. Bullseye. 4 p.m. That's a nice time to have a good nap after a sumptuous lunch. But these people were searching for the Messiah. Can you find sacrifice? What does it really ab abiding really mean? Sacrifice. Allocate your time to be with the word. To be with the Lord, to find out Messiah. What really arrest, what really touched me was this. Andrew knew the Lamb of God was the Messiah. The other disciple knew that the Lamb of God was the Messiah. Now Peter, he comes to know that Jesus is Messiah. He says, it is not enough that you know. It is not enough that he knows. I want to know. That was his desire. Why did Peter go to meet Jesus? He wanted to know the Messiah by himself. He will not live the, with the knowledge of others. He, lived, he wanted to live with his own personal knowledge. Are you willing to surrender your life? Spend time in the presence of God. Sacrificing your time. Saying, Lord, I will spend time with you. What a blessed experience to know him as our Messiah. As our bridegroom. Number two, second thought, rebuke God's, the look of the Lord. What did they do in the life of Peter? Rebuke. Mark's gospel, chapter 8, verse 33. Mark 8, 33. Mark 8, 33. When he had, but when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Here Jesus rebuked Peter. Proverbs 27.5 Open rebuke is better than secret love. The Lord looked at him and rebuked him. Why did Jesus rebuke Peter? Can somebody tell me why did Jesus rebuke Peter? Because Satan used Peter. Satan used Peter. Peter was a forefront disciple. At this time, Peter has become the forefront disciple. But Satan used Peter. And if you are a forefront believer, a long-standing senior believer, it's, long, it's not important how we started our spiritual race, but how we are right now is more important. Who is operating through us? Satan operated through Peter. Satan used the body of Peter. Dear child of God. There are two people in this world trying to possess us. Trying to control our body. One is the Holy Spirit. Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Glorify God through your body. Through your body glorify God. On the other end, when the evil spirit goes out from a person, when it is chased out, the, home, the heart becomes really decorative. It becomes clean. And next time when he finds out empty, it brings seven more evil spirits, more vile than this wants to occupy it. Two spirits, two things, and you know, those two spirits or two forces are trying to occupy our body. 
one is the holy spirit the other one is the evil spirit in this case satan occupied the body of peter senior believer dear child of god if you've been in the lord for a longer period of time check your life who is operating your eyes who is operating your fingers who is operating your heart mind feet legs your walk your talk your motives your intentions who is in control Bible says in 1st Corinthians 10 12 he wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall if i think that i am standing i should be very careful that i should not fall that i should not fall till the last breath of my life i need to be consistent i need to be consistent satan entered into judas the bible says and it was a night time it was a night time that satan entered it doesn't mean every time we go out in night satan will catch us no it is not so if the lord is with us we can face anything but the thought is this judas voluntarily gave himself to satan satan used the body of judas we need to tell the lord lord i will use my body as your dwelling place do you know when satan you know sees the opportunity to enter into peter do you know when we need to understand the context of this passage the context of this passage is this if you look at the previous verses 27 28 29 30 jesus asked his disciples what do people say that i am and the disciple said they said john the baptist and they say some say you are elijah and many others say you are one of the prophets but jesus said who do you say that i am who do you think that i am verse 29 but whom say ye that i am peter answered and saith unto them thou art christ thou art christ in this passage it is it stops with this but if you look at matthew's gospel chapter 16 verse 8 17 we find it is a revelation from god it is a revelation from god jesus himself says blessed art thou simon by john of for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you but my father which is in heaven has revealed revelation when he had revelation when you have revelation when you have a spiritual experience you need to be very careful in remaining humble this revelation always puts us into the higher pedestal we begin to think that we know better than others that's why paul says in first corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 he gives the reason why he was given a thorn in his flesh he says by the measure of the revelations that the lord gave me i should not get puffed up i should not get pride i should not get proud and this and the and and in the, you know the thorn was given and the lord did not remove that thorn mind you that the lord did not because god wanted paul to remain humble and peter he became proud when god gives you a spiritual experience please be careful to remain humble never give room to pride you know fine god gives you a revelation Every, everybody comes to know that find glory to god but remain humble now peter he goes to jesus and counsels jesus have you ever seen some believers counseling the servant of god they will be preaching after the preaching is over you know i thank god for my you know there are so many senior brothers in this church i treat them as my spiritual fathers they always come and you know you know correct me they always tell me for my own betterment i thank god for all my people who who tell me the other day one of the brothers after the sunrise service he gave a thought that was really blessed my heart i thank god for it but there are certain people they will put they will condemn criticize you know what does the bible say G- peter went to jesus and he rebuked can you read that verse can you find out that verse 
why did Jesus really rebuke Peter? Verse 32. 832. 832. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. He rebuked, he thought that he has, you know, God the Father, Heavenly Father has revealed things to him. Now he becomes a little proud and goes to Jesus and rebukes Jesus. Can you imagine this? Jesus being rebuked by this man. This is what spiritual pride can drive a person. And he became an agent of Satan. When God said, when Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. He did not look at Peter. You know, he did not point at Peter. He pointed the Satan that was inside Peter. He pointed out to the Satan that was inside Peter. The first phrase was at the Satan who was in Peter. In the second phrase, he said, Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but things that be of men. This phrase was at Peter. The moment Jesus rebuked Satan, who was inside Peter, Satan left. Do you know what Satan was trying? You know, look at the perspective of Jesus. Jesus had the purpose of God before him, going to the cross. But now Satan comes through Peter and he says, you should not go to Jerusalem. You should not die on the cross. Jesus said, you, the son of man shall be crucified on the cross. Will be kept behind the grave for three days. On the third day he will rise again. And Peter said, you shall not do this. There was purpose of God right in front of Jesus. Now Satan comes before. You know, look at the words. Get thee behind me. That means what does, what does it, what really took place? There was cross before Jesus. And Satan comes in between cross and Jesus. Now stands before at the face of Jesus. Can you imagine? Can you understand this picture? Why did Jesus say, get thee behind me? He, Satan came in front. Dear child of God. Just as our cross was before Jesus Christ. Cross is also before us. How do I say this? How do I say this? Look at what Jesus says. Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. Would you look at that verse, please? Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 34, 35. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Cross was not only before Jesus Christ, it was also, it is also before us. We need to take, I need to take up my cross. Satan comes and tells, and just as how Satan, you know, through Peter told Jesus that you should not take up your cross, that you should not take your cross, that you should not die on the cross. Enemy always comes and tells us, why should you die to yourself? Enjoy this world. After all, the Lord has blessed you. Enjoy this world. But dear child of God, this morning God looks at us. And tells us that we need to take up our cross and follow him. There's a, there, was a cross bef there was a cross before Jesus and we too have a cross. We need to take up our cross. He, he did not, you know, we need not take up his cross. We need to take our cross and die to ourselves every day. You know something, resurrection, you know, dying and resurrection took place only once in the life. You know, you know physically, physically, Jesus died. On the tree and he was buried for three days and he rose up on the third day. But every day Jesus was dying to himself since the day he was born. Bible says in Matthew's gospel chapter 4, Luke's gospel chapter 4, Satan tempted him. The, Satan left tempting Jesus for a season. That means what? Satan was always behind Jesus. Every day Jesus was dying to his self. And we are called to die every day. That's why Paul says, I die daily. Bible says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Dying to ourself. What should be our response to God's look of rebuke? Lord, I will take up my cross and die daily. And die daily. There's always a resistance. Somebody said like this, every night, every night you grow by an inch. This is a medically proven fact. 
every day when you fall flat on your bed, you grow an inch. This is really true. Ask somebody, did you grow yesterday night? You know, when we stand, the gravitational pull, you know, reduces our height. When the earth pulls us down, well, you know, don't, you know, blink at me, this is truth. This is scientific truth. You know, when you fall down flat, the pull, the gravitational pull, that is when you lie down on your bed, the gravitational pull will not affect your growth. But when you stand up, the gravity, the earth's pull, earth always takes, you know, talks about carnal things, worldly things. Worldly things always fight against our growth. How many of you are listening to what I'm saying? It always, you know, it is always against our growth. We need to tell the Lord, Lord, I will die to myself daily. I will die to myself. Dear child of God, how do we, how, do, how to fulfill those things that, are, that save us God? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14, verse, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 2 verse 11. How to fulfill those things that save us God, that pleases God. Peter did not do the things that pleased God. So he became an agent. His body became a, a temple for Satan. How should we look at this verse? For what man knoweth the things of God? No man knows it. But by the spirit of God. Verse 12. But now we have received not the spirit of world. But the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. We have the spirit of God. Verse 13. Which things we also speak not with words. With man's wisdom teacheth. But with the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14. For the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Spiritual man. So how can we fulfill this? Things that, that save us God, that pleases God. It's by walking in the spirit. What a blessed experience the spirit of God urges us. What a blessed experience to have a conversation with the Holy Spirit. At the end of the service, you know, we are blessed with threefold blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father. And the third blessing, you know, communion of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what is the explain? One of the meanings, communion of the Holy Spirit is conversation with the Holy Spirit. Just as how you converse with your friend, your, your father, your mother, how you talk to your neighbor, you can talk to the Holy Spirit. Conversing, you know, conversation with the Holy Spirit. The three blessed, you know, blessings, you know, blessed privileges that we can ever enjoy in this world. Dear child of God, what should be our response? Lord, I will walk according to your spirit so that your spirit will dwell inside of me. That I will speak, that I will do things that save us you. That I will become a worthy vessel in your sight. If you are a senior believer... I cannot, if I am a senior believer, I cannot run my race with my old achievements, my, you know, past experience. Have you seen the record of a, a cricketer or a football, footballer? He will have his career statistics, you know, scored a hat-trick in, in so-and-so place against so-and-so team. That shouldn't be our experience. Just one experience, our current experience, our, our you know, current spiritual standing. Is our body the temple of the Holy Spirit? And quickly, the third point, recompense. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 21. Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, we find Jesus Christ beholding a young man, young ruler, he wanted to know the way to everlasting life. And Jesus said, Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and take up the cross and follow me. We all know this context. We need not get into the detail for lack of time. In the same context, 
Jesus looks at his disciple, including Peter. The same context is reiterated in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 26. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 26. Same incident, but in a different Gospel, Matthew's Gospel. But Jesus beheld them, disciples. He beheld di disciples, including Peter, and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. But let us look at how Jesus beheld this young man and promised him rec recompense. And this young rich ruler, he had great possessions. He had great possessions. And Jesus told him, go and sell all that you have and give the money to the poor. Come to me and follow me. And at that context, in that context, and this man, young, young man, he would not leave his possessions, goes away with grief in his heart. And Peter steps up and he says, Lord, we have forsaken all and we have followed. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you know, would you read that verse? Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Mark's gospel, chapter 10, verse 29. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left his house or his brethren, sisters, father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel. But he shall have hundredfold now in this time. Please underline the word, three few verses. Hundredfold in this time. Houses, brothers, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands with, pers with persecutions in the world to come. Eternal life. The Lord promises hundredfold this life, eternal life, the regeneration. You know, look at what Jesus told this young man. What did Jesus tell him? Would you please interact, please? What did Jesus tell? Sell all you have. Get the money. Give it to the poor. Look at these two words. Sell, give. And I will give you hundredfold. Do you understand this? Jesus told this young man, sell all you have. Give. Let your hands become empty. Now I will give you 100 fold. The Lord said, what you have as great possessions is not, is not the greatest thing that you can ever have. Do you understand what I say? What did, really, what did Jesus really mean by sell and give? The Lord said, all this while you thought these great possessions are yours. And you are the owner of it. It is God who blesses us. Why did Jesus specifically tell this man, sell? Jesus knew that he not only possessed his great possessions, his possessions possessed this man. He became a slave to this possession. And that's the reason why Jesus specifically told him, sell. In other words, Jesus said, you don't be the owner of all these things. Because the moment you become the owner of all these things, these things have become your owner. Sell. Lose your control over all these things. Let your hands become empty. Do you know what? The Lord is talking to few people. Probably you are holding on to something that you deem it as great possessions. The Lord wants to hand, it over, hand over you hundredfold more. You know, Bible says He's the Lord God who grants us more abundantly than what we ask or think of. If you are holding on to something, give it away. The Lord says, sell it away. Lose your ownership. Lose your ownership. I'm going to give you a hundredfold. Probably you may be thinking, it is the Lord God who has given me, blessed me. True, there's no doubt about it. But this morning God says, I want to own you. I want you to become my disciple, dear child of God, what is that one thing that you are holding that you deem it as a great possession? Throw it away. Give it away. The Lord is promising you recompense. What, you know, what is the recompense? Hundredfold this time and eternal life in the regeneration. How many of you believe? Dear child of God, you may be, that, that could be one thing, that one thing could be, you know, your mobile phone, one activity that you really love, like, one aspect of your life that you wouldn't want to forfeit. This morning God says, sell it away, give it away, lose your ownership. 
that your hands become empty i want to bless you with 100 fold 100 fold you child of god never cling on to that throw it away throw your self will away this morning god is promising you recompense and peter he says lord we have forsaken all and we are following you just as our peter forsook all and followed i'll have this testimony let us not be like that young man who wouldn't want to sell and give it away let us be people lord willingly surrender i willingly and i think about my life you know probably 15 years back one of our church members she vacated her house shifted her house so my brother and myself helped her out and as a as a token of love she uh she gave something to me in my hands and you know some money in my hands in my brother's hand she gave a flute a flute indian flute and my brother he tried blowing it you no know, just only air came and he she said he threw it away i thought i took it out i started playing it it came so beautifully and you know, i started playing it i thought okay i'm going to become a flutist and i'm i'm going to become a musician believe me i was playing i was really playing well you know i can play any song i thought okay i'm doing well one day our pastor saw me playing that i know what moved him and he came and told me what are you playing i told him pastor this is flute indian flute you know and he said don't use this instrument throw it away i was really you know my heart really burnt within me why what's wrong in this and he gave me a reason which indian god uses this you wouldn't believe me you know i was broken i thought my ambition of becoming a flutist just dream destroyed got destroyed on that day i came inside the church and kept the flute down i smashed it with tears in my heart not tears in my eyes tears in my heart i smashed it out and that very night on that night i i really regretted why i did that because you know i cannot can never can never have a flute like that you know with correct pitching if you are a musician you will understand what i say a flute your flute should have the correct pitching it had everything and i said lord i do not know how much it grieves my heart i will obey my spiritual father i will obey the counsel that he gave me i obeyed you won't believe me very next saturday as we were cleaning the church there was one guitar one very old guitar what our one of our brothers senior brothers used and our pastor said why can't you take the take up that guitar and use it because if you don't use it it will be, become become warped it will become useless and that is how you know everything started with guitar now i think if i had only become a flute a flutist somebody who plays the flute i wouldn't be singing and playing just as i am right now doing what i say is what i want to say is when this council gave to me to give it away lose your ownership it was grievous honestly it was a severe battle that went inside of me what's wrong i did i don't commit any sin what's the big deal in this what's a big loss in this why should the lord point out this thing to me and i said lord i'm leaving this the lord gave me something better i thought flute was my great possession but when i left it i received 100 fold do you agree with what i say when god tells you to forfeit something never hesitate give it away lose your you know ownership look at you know in all the passages in all the passages in the three gospels that records this incident we find recompense 100 fold recompense 100 fold recompense matthew's gospel chapter 18 verse 28 where jesus said unto them matthew 18 28 verily i say unto you this that you which have followed me in the regeneration when the son of man shall sit in the throne of his glory you shall have you shall sit upon his upon 12 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes and every one that forsaketh houses brother and sisters father mother children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life luke 18:28 let's let me read for verse 30 for want of time who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come come life everlasting dear child of god the lord is 
asking you to lose your rulership ownership just to become the bride of Christ god blesses us but those things should not possess us we need to tell the lord i am your slave i want to be under you lord i want to be under you thank you lord thank you lord the lord gives the reason why we should sell why we should forfeit the lord says for my name's sake if you forsake all for my name's sake when i say my name's sake as i told you you know in hebraic perspective name denotes nature for the nature of christ to possess the nature of christ if you are willing to forfeit your own rights your own privileges you shall be blessed 100 fold this time this age this world and everlasting life in the age to come how many of you are listening to what the spirit of god is speaking never resist the voice of god young girl young boy if you are holding on to something that you deem special to you and if the lord tells you throw it away i don't want you to have throw it away in jesus name you shall be blessed 100 fold blessing is waiting for you if you are willing to empty your hands dear father dear mother dear brother dear sister if you are willing to empty your hand for the sake of god for the sake of his kingdom for his nature 100 fold blessing 100 fold re- recompense is coming towards you tell the lord i'm willing to forfeit everything just as you heard yesterday in the sanctification meeting it's not how much we lift determines our strength but how much we leave how much we throw it away how much we let it go how much we throw it away thank you lord thank you lord if you know the spirit of god is speaking to you never hold on to those things dear brother dear sister leave it away for the will of god for the purpose of god for holiness for righteousness for to if you want to love righteousness you have to hate wickedness that's what the bible says about the lord jesus christ in psalm 45 he loved righteousness and hated wickedness if you want to love righteousness you have to hate hate wickedness there's no in between thing either of either of this let us serve the lord how many of us are merged by the lord let us surrender our lives lord would you lift up your voice hands in the presence of god i empty my hand lord i empty my hand i empty my hand ri karama satara la raba ri andala raba karama dara the presence of god is in this place you are really special in god's sight you are really special in god's sight thank you father for your awesome presence in this place Oh thank you lord thank you lord briefly last point luke's gospel chapter 22 verse 61 62 his look of reminder you know this is about peter again peter jesus was about to be crucified he was taken to taken on a trial Peter has denied thrice Jesus and cock cross second time at that time verse 61 Luke's gospel 22 61 the lord turned and looked upon Peter and Peter remembered the word of the lord how he had said unto him before the cock crew thou shall deny me thrice if you look at for four gospels the first three gospels pictures probably pictures peter as a negative person but if you look at fourth gospel john's gospel you can find it wasn't peter alone who followed jesus it was another disciple along with peter who followed jesus to the trial room bible says john's gospel chapter 18 verse 15 peter and another disciple who was known to the high priest went in with jesus into the palace the high priest peter was with jesus john's gospel chapter 18 verse 15 peter was with jesus with one of another of his disciples you know another disciples along with jesus he risked everything he went to the palace he knew very well if you look at 
the subsequent verses one of the one of the one of the person who identified identified peter said i know this person i saw him in the garden because malchus who's here peter severed was was a relative of this person she identified this person in spite of all those things peter was there peter was there unfortunately peter denied jesus thrice and jesus turned about and looked at him and peter remembered the child of god today the lord is looking at you reminding of reminding you of what you promised him what you said people might have given a deaf ear to what you said but every vow that you made with the lord every promise that you made with the lord the lord views it seriously the lord views it seriously you may be following the lord following the lord bible says in verse 15 of john 18 he was with jesus in 16 verse 16 verse 17 he went away he could not he would not be with jesus in verse 15 he was with jesus but in verse 16 and 17 there was a distance between there there became there came a distance between jesus and him the other gospel writers record the jesus peter followed jesus afar off the distance between jesus and peter made peter to deny this morning the look of god is upon you and he's watching over you and he tells you what about the words that you said you said peter you said even if all others leave you lord i will be with you you were with me in verse 15 but in verse 16 and 17 where are you peter peter was warming himself because of the cold along with the officers of the pharisees along with the officers of the pharisees he was warming himself dear child of god you have come you might have come into the presence of god having a distance between you and god no one knows about this there's a distance between you and god you had a wonderful conversation with the lord and you still you stuck on to what you promised god but now there's a dif- there's a distance between you and god God knows everything. God knows everything. And Jesus looked at Peter. Jesus turned and looked at Peter. The eyes of the Lord is looking at you. Dear child of God. Probably in the presence of God. As you are seated. You may say. I walked so very closely with the Lord. But not now. but not now i don't have that communion with god now but this morning the eyes of the lord is looking at you the eyes of god looking at you it wants to restore that fellowship restore that closeness bible says peter remember the word of the lord by verse 362 peter went out and wept bitterly peter went out wept bitterly he went out wept bitterly because his conscience convicted him conscience really convicted him and he couldn't bear the sight of jesus looking at him not that he hated jesus he really disliked himself he disliked himself to the extent that he wouldn't be called as one of the disciples he wouldn't be called as one of the disciples he wouldn't be called as one of the disciples that's why when the lord sent an angel to tell to the disciples that that he is going before them to galilee the lord said the lord sent a message to an angel through an angel 
Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 7. This tells us how much Peter was broken within himself. Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 7. Bo but go your way, tell his disciples. Go your way and tell his disciples. And look at the next word, and Peter. Peter would not reckon himself as a disciple. His convic conviction within him so, so much, the look of Jesus on that day, brought a tremendous conviction in him that he, could not, he would not reckon himself as a disciple. And that's the reason why the Lord sent a word through angel, Lord, you know, Lord, Lord sent a word through an angel to his disciples. Go and tell my disciples and Peter, I still love him. Dear, dear child of God, I was really touched when I read 1 Corinthians. Thank you, Lord. Chapter 15, verse 5. Can somebody make out anything out of this verse? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5. The context is Jesus rose from the dead, resurrected Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5. Can somebody find out anything out of this? He was seen of Cephas. Look at the next two words. And then, can you imagine... Do you know who was the first disciple among all the disciples, you know, the core disciples? Do you know who was the first disciple that Jesus wanted to show himself? It was Peter. It was Peter because of the repentance that he had. See how much God honored this man. It's all because of repentance. He wept bitterly. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 2, he was the first disciple, apostle to be chosen. Now he considers himself no longer a disciple. And the look of Jesus brought a tremendous conviction. I'm urged by the Lord to tell you this morning, you may be seated in the presence of God, have a, having a self-condemnation within yourself. Lord, I'm not fit. I'm unfit, Lord. I have distanced myself from you. This morning the Lord says, you are still first in my sight, my Peter. You were first in Matthew 10, 2. You are still first in my sight. 1 Corinthians 15, 5. He was seen of Cephas and then his disciples. Can you imagine the love of God? The Lord loves you. Just the way he loved you when you showed your first love to him. You need not do anything extra or you need not decrease doing something less to increase God's love or decrease God's love. He loves you. This morning the look of the Lord, would you close your eyes? This morning the look of the Lord is upon your life. What should be your response to this look? That reminds you of what you said. Would you surrender your life with deep most convic conviction? Lord, I surrender. His tears, his tears was a symbol of his deepest surrender. Dear child of God, thank you, Lord. You may say, Lord, I was once first. I was once first, even now, brother, sister, even now, you are not last in the sight of God. You are still the first in God's sight. Among all the disciples, Cephas was the first one to see the resurrected Savior inside that room. Among all the others, the Lord sees you as the first. The Lord sees you. His love is still upon your life. The Lord still loves you. The Lord still wants you now. Do you know what the Lord told those women? Go and tell my brethren. 
go and tell my brethren the lord told them told them go and tell my brethren peter said i don't know him peter might have disowned the lord but the lord did not disown peter he still had peter in his mind as one of his brothers dear child of god the lord still has you in his mind you are not a castaway in the sight of god the lord has you in his mind you are still first in his sight your condom your condemnation your heart may convict you you may be condemned inside your heart saying lord i lost your fellowship i've moved far away from you i stopped following you i started to relish my time with something else this morning the look of the lord is upon your life the lord looks at you and says i still love you i want you would you stand up to your feet as a token of your surrender and tell the lord thank you lord ni mara karaba shatara la ramadaria turi la raba karaba shakara marianda la rabodara we are going to take part in the holy communion The Lord looked at Peter after all those incident. Do you love me Peter? Peter said, "Lord, I love you." Again the Lord said, "Do you really love me?" "Lord, I love you." 